Here's a little test for me. Uh, I'm introducing Catherine Menzel. That's not the test, the test is the title. And her title is uh, Bacterial Viruses, Adventitious Fungi, and Sporiferous Anthrax Bacilli, Adjective Noun Constructions and Texts from Microbe Hunters in the 19th Century Royal Society Publications. Okay. Thank you for the introduction and thank you very much for inviting me to this conference and for giving me the opportunity to talk about early texts with relevance uh, for, to the development of medical microbiology from the end of the late modern English period. The title says 19th century, but in fact, some of my analysis will include texts until 1920 also. And this is the outline of my talk. Uh, I will explain what we may investigate with regard to texts that uh, deal with microorganisms in late modern English uh, period. I will tell how we can find these texts in a much disciplinary diaconic corpus, the Royal Society corpus. And then I will give an overview on the text authors and their specific research fields related to microorganisms. And I will show some results with uh, regard to analysis of adjective noun patterns that are major term, for, term formation patterns in microbiology as a nascent discipline. So the research questions I would like to address are the following. How do the types of adjective plus noun patterns in late modern English microbiology texts change over time? Do the texts have specific information density? That means the price of profiles with regard to adjective plus noun patterns. And do texts with female authors or co-authors have a distinctive use of adjective plus noun patterns compared to texts written only by male authors? The data I will use here is the Royal Society Corpus, built in Saarbrücken over several years in a sub-project of uh, a collaborative research center on information density and linguistic encoding. And at a previous conference on historical medical discourse, we have already presented this data and explained how to identify texts with medical implications from the 70s to the 20th century in this corpus. The Royal Society Corpus contains various articles with medical implications, often with particular political, economic or cultural importance. The RSC contains the digitized articles of several um, of the longest running Royal Society journals, mainly the philosophical transactions and proceedings. And they started as well the general scientific journals and they were never dedicated to medical research uh, in particular, like medical journals. But we have articles on medical topics throughout the data and texts on microbiology with implications for the development of medical discourse from the uh, end of the late modern English period onwards. And how do we identify texts on microorganisms in this multidisciplinary corpus in the time span of our interest? Uh, the application of probabilistic topic models to this corpus with regard to historical medical text has already been described previously. And all texts have been assigned primary and secondary topics according to their relative importance. Here I wish to build on these findings uh, from this analysis and I would like to identify not medical texts in general here, but early texts with relevance to the development of medical microbiology, the study of the characteristics of pathogens and other microorganisms. So in this example of an RSC topic model with topic clustering, Medical texts can mainly be found in four topics, namely reproduction, cells, paleontology and physiology. And but texts on microorganisms are not yet in one particular group here. They can, for instance, fall into the group of physiology text, texts on cells or experiments or chemistries, while these groups also contain other texts not relevant for microbiology. So one of the newer topic models on a current corpus version looks slightly different. Here the figure shows a part of this models with topics from the life sciences and we do not have medical research here in particular in contrast to the uh, previous one, but we have immunology here that is close here to topics such as biochemistry and physiology. And in fact, if we look at these immunology texts in more detail, most of them are actually related to microorganisms. They were initially uh, labeled manually, this topic. So this one has been labeled immunology on the basis of birds, such as the ones that we see here. But the label in the topic model uh, might also be changed to microbiology. That would be more appropriate, I think. And that means that the RSC text uh, from the life sciences related to microbiology with direct or indirect implications for medical research can be identified easily by taking the automatically generated metadata of the text into account. So here's an example of a CQP query, for instance, 
to query for a particular topic, for instance, physiology that has many of other um, medical texts. So in, for instance, if you want to create a subcorpus of decades, uh, 1860s to 1890s on uh, medical texts, we can do a query like this and uh, extract texts on the topic. So also texts on microorganisms can be extracted quite easily with the, quest, uh, with the query like this for immunology text as a primary or secondary topic. Um, so I think uh, we might say that the history of microbiology spans almost 350 years, starting with work by Robert Hooke and the microscope and the discoveries by Anthony van Leeuwenhoek that we see here, who we see here. And we have several of these texts also in the RSC, such as this one here. Um, however, the discovery of um, tiny living beings by van Leeuwenhoek were doubted by natural scientists for a long time. In the topic model, also these very early texts from the 17th century do not fall yet into our group of immunology texts, as the more modern texts on microorganisms use different words. And here in the early text, we have no specific names yet for microorganisms um, that were observed with early microscopes. Van Leeuwenhoek, for instance, speaks of animalculae, little animals. And it doesn't get more specific. And then uh, let's focus here on the end of the late modern English period, where we witnessed the emergence of microbiology in Britain as a emerging uh, as a nascent discipline, and we find many papers that contribute to the intellectual foundations of modern medical um, microbiology. So the figures show the numbers of the RSC text and the size of these texts, with immunology as the primary or secondary topic. Almost all texts fall, uh, that fall under our topic date from the 1860s to 1920. Few corpus texts in the data uh, are from before um, 1860, only 18, and I excluded them here to, due to their low number. Uh, texts after 1920 again start to be different in their usage of words, and additionally a different topic model has been used for these newer texts, so they would also the relevant text would also fall under a different topic in the results of topic modeling. But it makes sense to look at texts from 1860 onwards. Um, it was one year after the publication of Darwin's On the Origin of Species, and it was also uh, 1860 was also the year when the English translation of Pasteur's new experiments relative to so-called spontaneous generation was published. And it was a time of landmark discoveries in the area of bacteriology, particularly in Germany and France, that were the main centers of research in this field at the time. And there was also a growth of systematic state-funded research, uh, full-time post, and um, yeah, slowly also journals start, and societies that were specialized started to be founded. Another important development was the mass production of the microscope, for instance, in Germany by Zeiss. And these graphs show that there are more texts over time on microorganisms. And the chart on the right showing the number of tokens suggests a peak on, of activities in the 1890s. But in fact, we have some very long texts in the 1890s that contribute to this peak, particularly increasingly long reports by the Royal Society Water Research Committee on pathogenic bacteria in the River Thames at this time. Um, yeah, we know this is a time of increasing specialization and there are more specialized journals, of course, over time than the philosophical transactions and the proceedings of the interdisciplinary Royal Society. Here are some examples of other sources from this time span that are not included in our data because they are not um, available in digitized format. And uh, there was some cooperation between scholars from the Royal Societies and scholars that uh, published also in these data. So many papers by authors that we have in our data, um, uh, many authors published also in journals like this. And um, for instance, um, Joseph Lister, um, developer of antiseptic surgery, published most often in the British Medical Journal, but we also have texts by him in our data or John Burden Sanderson, he was um, president of the Pathological Society of London, but also a fellow of the Royal Society and published many papers also in transactions. Other examples of more specialized journals that unfortunately we can't compare to our data yet. And uh, I skip this. I will just uh, yeah, say some words uh, on the authors and their research fields by illustrating them with some examples. Um, Henry Charles Bastian is one of the authors. Uh, he, had a he had considerable influence in Britain as a professor of pathological anatomy in London. 
He explained the origin of diseases by the spontaneous generation of bacterial life out of nothing, so from lifeless matter, and he was an opponent of Pasteur's work. I think uh, the discussions by people like him uh, are a reason for um, the delay in research in Britain compared to Germany and France because there were many um, people doubting um, the new knowledge from abroad like him and trying to provide different explanations. So here's an example of a paper in the last sentence. He says that the work and the views of uh, Pasteur are untenable. Another author um, was John uh, Tinder, professor of natural philosophy in London and an early convert to the germ theory of diseases and opponent of experimental work like Bastian's uh, that tried to prove the possibility of sp spontaneous generation. In Tinder's papers, he discusses the work of others uh, in, the eight, in the 60s and 70s of the, of, the, um, yeah, of the 19th century, but he also made experiments and discoveries of medical significance. John Burden Sanderson was a professor of physiology in London and later in Oxford and was also interested in the relation of microorganisms to disease and carried out chemical experiments, for instance, with Bastian, um, Henry Roscoe, another uh, author who wrote occasional papers on bacteriology, uh, Henry Marshall Ward, um, prof professor of botany in Cambridge, and David Bruce, um, very prominent in um, yeah, treating tropical diseases, working in Uganda with his wife, who is also an author in our data. Yeah, female authors are very prominent in this data. Here's a list of them. So uh, Grace Franklin published as a um, wife of uh, Percy Franklin, a fellow of the Royal Society. So these women were usually the wives of authors publishing or the students of them. One of the students is Maria Dawson, who worked with Harry uh, Marshall Ward in Cambridge, whom I just mentioned a bit earlier. So she worked on microbes in agricultural research. And yeah, the adjectives he, she uses uh, make me think about uh, women's uh, language here. So for instance, she talks a beautiful coral pink uh, and a beautiful pink stain about the results of her laboratory experiments. Many color adjectives such as creamish white that no one else uses in the entire corpus. And she is one of the few who calls the subject of study interesting organisms. That's also quite particularly. Uh, Mary Bruce, uh, another author, yeah, she published with her husband, um, um, David Bruce, uh, working in the um, yeah, in Africa, more in the military context. They did a lot of experiments with um, animals and um, working, uh, she was working a lot behind the microscope. So, so what we can then we learn from adjective noun patterns in the microbiology text? So the examples from the title of this talk, such as adventitious are borrowings from Latin combined with English elements. So various words are taken from Latin, either directly or through French or even through neoclassical German patterns. And uh, how do they change over time? Um, so let's look at some results here due to the limited time. A simple frequency analysis uh, visualized in the word clouds of the top 20 adjective noun patterns primarily reflects the progress of the nascent disciplines and the main topics discussed in the respective time spans. So here in the 1860s and 70s, we still see a lot of general vocabulary in this pattern describing uh, chemical experiments. Uh, for instance, we have collocations like few days, other tubes, common air, and many of the frequent patterns like distilled water or spontaneous generation, floating matter or bacterial life are a hint of the main research question in these decades. Where do the microorganisms come from? And this question seems to dominate less in the next two decades, where here's another, um, yeah, mainly steps in further practical laboratory work that is reflected in the patterns. Uh, words here are a bit shorter, even on average, compared to the earlier period. We have, for instance, pure cultures on the right, uh, referring to a key method Koch had developed in the 70s, namely the isolation of pure cultures of bacteria. If you look at the previous image from the 80s and 90s again and compare it here with the beginning of the 20th century, we see that again experiments are important, but it's a time where the main focus is on finding medical treatments for specific infectious diseases. So we have red cells, we have infected flies, we have normal or heated serum, 
and phagocytic index. So uh, red blood here, is, I should have deleted it, but I left it in uh, as an example. Actually, that's part of a longer pattern, adjective plus two nouns. That is very rare in this time period to have noun clusters of two nouns, red blood cells or something like this. It really is only later than the nouns get more specific that we have more than one modifier of a noun, more than one pre-modifier of a noun. So we can further investigate and combine such results with word embeddings. So here um, is an example from the interactive from the interactive visualization that is publicly available. So we can look at typical semantic context for individual words in the entire time span or individual decades. If we zoom in on infected, for instance, in the same cluster, we have words from typical context of this field um, here in the 1910s, infected occurs with words such as tse flies and parasitism and with disease names and languages from India and Africa, for instance, Syria and Nagana. And uh, to see differences in much more specialized vocabulary and field specific terminology over time, we can restrict our queries to adjectives of a certain length. I think this is even more interesting to see the top 20 adjective noun patterns with adjectives longer than nine characters. Here an example, the 1980s and 90s compared to the next 20 years. So we find another example from the title of this talk, Sporiferous, so for instance, used with anthrax. And we see uh, that the later texts become more focused on specific topics as the same adjectives or the same nouns occur in various combinations. For instance, phagocytic can be found several times. Animal experiments play an important role. We have experimental animals and susceptible animals in this figure on the right. And various of these longer adjectives are derived from borrowings from other languages, such as neoclassical formations from German. For instance, phagocytic is related to the theories of the Russian scholar Mechkinov publishing his work in German. He also won uh, the Nobel Prize for the uh, discovery of the phagocyten. Okay. Um, other examples from borrowed from German as neoclassical compounds. There are many of them. I skipped. Them, but it's also interesting that uh, noun compounds can become adjective uh, noun combinations in translation. Not so much influence from French. There's uh, only one example, for instance, of a noun followed by um, adjective that I found uh, integrated into English syntax with substance sensibilities. Often the French texts were uh, not translated, but here the colonial lecture was delivered in French and printed in the transactions entirely in French. An author from the Institut Pasteur uh, presented his work in French in London and then uh, it was published entirely in French. So not often these uh, terms get uh, translated and integrated into sentences like the German terminology. So um, surprisal patterns, um, yeah, choosing an appropriate measure of linguistic complexity is difficult, but um, yeah, let's take Shannon's notion of surprisal here. And uh, I show an example here with actual text um, from an information theoretic perspective. Processing effort is related to surprise that can be measured in bits. For instance, life after the context of the bacterial is rather predictable and has lower surprise values in our data than metabolism after of the bacterial, as in this time period, it was rarely the case that people discuss such details of bacterial life that microbes have their own metabolism. So there is a visualization also of this. You can see this visualized with the size. So the bigger, um, the higher the surprise is. So for instance, here adventitious uh, followed by fungi. Um, fungi is not so surprising here because the three words that come before it often occur in front of it. So I skip this maybe, but the surprise values of adjectives and nouns in the microbiology text, if we compare them for, to another crop, topic such as biochemistry that was very close in the topic model, there's already a difference. So there is a smaller range of surprise values in biochemistry as the upper quartile and the maximum or higher in immunology for adjectives before nouns and nouns after adjectives. And in immunology, there are fewer outliers with high surprise. That means the words occur regularly with higher information density and unpredictability in that context. Um, some remarks on the text with uh, female authors and co-authors. So I had the assumption that women might use more adjectives, but the opposite was the case. Analysis of various samples showed that women use a rich variety of adjectives, but if you compare the overall number of adjectives in microbiology texts, 
There are, in any case, uh, every pattern that we compare women use fewer, and the longer the patterns become, uh, the female authors use fewer of them. So probably they also use a more involved style, less uh, we have fewer noun patterns uh, modified in any case, and they use uh, less terminology than male authors. And uh, to summarize from the analysis in the RSC, I conclude that modern microbiology emerged in the late 19th century in Britain from the effort of um, yeah, a relatively small number of gifted investigators, often yeah, um, introducing the new knowledge from abroad. Uh, among them were many women that were vividly following developments, uh, particularly in France and Germany. And uh, yeah, the early investigations of microbes developed out of existing fields of inquiry and familiar practical problems such as disease and its spread, fermentation and soil fertility, so um, problems of long-standing importance under investigation by experts also from various other um, traditional subjects. So the early years in Britain are marked by uh, various theoretical discussions and the evolution of life and its building blocks in general and linked with experiments. And then new resources and methods started to be used. So we have seen uh, with regard to adjective plus noun patterns that they change primarily with regard to the semantic fields and their length. And that serves as an indicator of the specificity of the terminology. They occur regularly with high information density and unpredictability in their context in the analyzed time span. And female authors use fewer adjectives and fewer adjectives plus noun patterns, which also are typically shorter uh, than in publications by male authors. So let me thank, thank you and end this talk with the remark uh, that texts like the ones in the RSC led to important changes in medical concepts such as diseases because of the profound changes in beliefs about the causes of disease. And changing term patterns in the text reflect such uh, developments. Thank you very much. <laughs>
when you can't name the probabilities of the engrams, is that, and you've got this temporal focus, would it have been on the same focus, or what was your base focus for those? I think you know, I think we have several ways of um, this uh, language models. I think they have several uh, surprise values also annotated. You can choose between them, and uh, so there are also, also tokenized or lemmatized versions. So, because um, I think the way that you're using it is really fascinating. The idea of open development and discourse, especially these phrases, become less surprising because they're established and, and, and but by using this technique, you can find the places where there's you know. Times where people are experimenting for a um, coin, you sort of phrase it there. Yeah. But, so I was wondering, but to do that, you, you need to kind of move temporarily through your corpus, right? Yeah. Your frequencies from the whole corpus. So, of course, yeah, and some um, models take um, decades as the base or uh, 50 years time span to compare and um, some give you the surprise of each word or the average surprise of the word in the whole time span. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> you can choose uh, different versions of it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so we uh, I find that one of the more plausible uses of topic mapping actually, because you don't ignore the structure that you have. Topic models, uh, topic mapping papers often irritated by just treating things sort of large, bracket and differentiated text that we know nothing about. Yeah. But you're using the metadata, so you have a prior classification that you're working through, and that actually therefore strikes me as altogether more plausible. You're sort of not pretending that you're discovering structure that you already know is there, which something you just do. Yeah. So I thought that was quite good. On that point about time, or global things. And some work where we've sort of used a sliding window to look at points where we call the collocation is very similar to your word in many of the surprise and effect, where you're getting real uh, flexions really in the behavior of the words, whether uh, the behavior is destabilizing at that point and then reaching new plateaus of stability. So that might be something interesting to look at because it can make it quite fine grained and try and find precise points where these shifts in usage are actually occurring. I think that was in the uh, Gavin's Journal, the International Journal of Office, and it's a very interesting drop me in line and send you this. Okay, thank you. But it's a nice way of doing it because it's really just a technique which focuses upon when a word's usage is changing. You'd say it's surprised that it's changing, and you'd be quite right. So you just run a different statistic with it, but the same basic technique of using a sliding window mm -hmm. uh, then actually allows you to see visually where these words are altering in some way and then reattaining some degree of relative stability. And I think that would actually address okay. all the Yeah, okay, thank you. Then. My <laughs> pleasure. It was great. Thank you. Enjoy listening.